As you know, India has had an explosion of entrepreneurship. Hmm. There were just 1,000 startups in 2016, and right. now there are 100,000. Right. Which means that every one of these young people has figured out something and thought that there's a better way of doing it. And the moment you think there's a better way of doing it, then it takes time. Then automatically, the long-termness sets in. Hi guys, and welcome to another episode of Umi Doki Udan. Guys, who do we call a winner in life? Someone who's built a startup and taken India's name all over the world because of the size of impact it has created. Someone who's created a social program that is so impactful that the poorest person in the country has been impacted. Or someone who simply has a beautiful family life, two beautiful children who are successful in their own right. Now imagine having someone who's achieved all the three things. In fact, I would say this is a personal career highlight for me to sit across from Nandan Nilekani and get a chance to interview him. Nandan, thank you so much for doing this with us. Nandan, so many achievements, so many things you've seen over the years. You've almost seen India grow up over the years. In this journey, what were the sacrifices you had to make? Well, if you look at my Infosys journey, uh, I was one of the co-founders and we began in 1981 under the leadership of uh, Mr. Narayan Murthy. And uh, those were very tough times to do business. So we were, uh, you know, we didn't have much money and uh, it was even difficult to get a phone connection in India in those days. So I think we went through some difficult times, uh, and uh, but we managed to hang in there because we had a vision of creating this globally respected company. So there, there were quite a few of those uh, things. And then of course in the government, I had also to deal with many... Uh, Red tape, bureaucracy kind of challenges. I mean also, there are many people who opposed my the project I was mm. doing, and then you know they wanted to stop it, and you know those kind of things. So you have to sort of uh, figure out how to get things done in a very complex environment. That's what I've learned. Right, and yet I want you to focus a little bit more on the sacrifices you had to make, things that sure. attracted you but you couldn't do because you wanted to do yeah. these. Yeah, one is of course frugal living, because uh, we didn't have much money because whatever money we had, we put it into the company. Right. So, you know, you couldn't do lifestyle, I think, I didn't have a car, uh, would uh, travel by a bus or by a scooter or something, uh, go and live abroad for a long time in the U.S. while my family was here. Right. You know, all these kind of uh, things which were uh, things you did to, for the sake of the company. You know, putting right. the company ahead of personal comforts or uh, personal benefits. Where does that come from, Nandan? Uh, this thing where you put the interests of the company, eventually the country ahead of your interests? Well, you know, certainly I think uh, Mr. Murthy's uh, leadership was very charismatic. He could motivate people mm. to uh, put, uh, you know, service before self. And also I think over the years I've realized that if you are willing to postpone rewards, you actually get bigger rewards. Uh, at, when you're starting, it's just a belief, but mm. you know, it actually happened in, certainly in my case that, you know, and we call that as deferred gratification. Right. And I think uh, that's something which is required if you want to really build something of scale and something impactful. And you've seen that pan out always for yourself? Oh, absolutely. I mean, everything that I've done uh, has been with a long time frame. Yeah. Uh, to bring change at, at the company scale or population scale uh, and uh, with a lot of, you know, uh, bumps on the way. It takes time to get this right. done. But I think if you believe in the big idea, believe in the purpose, then you can be motivated. And the other thing which happens, which is very important, is that when you are pursuing a big idea, other people, like-minded people join you. Join you. So you're yeah. not lonely in that sense. You're that great. brings the energy. So just the energy of a big idea yeah. is something yeah. that you can unleash. Nandan, today's world is more and more short term. Uh, you know, my gratification comes on Instagram by being in a interesting place. Like if I put a picture with you right now on LinkedIn, I'm going to get a bigger reward in a very short term kind of a way, right? In a short term world, how does a youngster train himself to think long term? Well, probably maybe use less social media, <laughs> I don't know. Well, I, th I think uh, you're right. I mean, you post something and there's so many likes and you get that instant gratification. But I think it's what has happened is today's world with phones in everybody's hand, with all the various social media tools, <coughs> does encourage, uh, you know, instant rewards. So I, I think uh, part of it is perhaps to have ambitious goals. I think if you have ambitious goals for personally or for your company or for society, then it forces you to think uh, more long term. Uh, 
Uh, otherwise, you know, you, you just uh, fritter it away. How does the long-term mind work and how can I train my mind to be thinking long-term? Well, I think I see it a lot because I think, uh, as you know, India has had an explosion of entrepreneurship. Hmm. There were just 1,000 startups in 2016 and right. now there are 100,000. Right. Which means that every one of these young people has figured out something and thought that there's a better way of doing it. And the moment you think there's a better way of doing it, then it takes time. Then okay. automatically the long-termness sets in because it means building a company, getting people, raising capital, launching a product. So I find many of the young entrepreneurs I meet are thinking long-term with bold, ambitious plans. So I think there are plenty of people out there who are thinking like that. Nanan, you mentioned the impact of Mr. Murthy in your early career and there is a stage where it you feel a dearth of a mentor, of a leader that you can commit to, you can uh, follow. How do I pick the right mentor for my journey ahead? A lot of it is luck. I mean, I was lucky when hmm. I came out of IIT Bombay in uh, late 79. I heard about a company where they had they were importing mini computers and I went and that's how I met Murthy. It was pure luck or serendipity. But I think if that's where I think uh, aggregation of uh, talented people in a town helps like if people are in Bangalore or Gurgaon or, or Powai or whatever in Bombay. I think just ha being around more talented people, uh, actually you meet people and you know, you're know you bound to find somebody uh, whom you think can be a good mentor. And also I think in the startup world, the a person can be mentored in a company and then after a few years he will start his own company. So right. I think that pattern I see more and more. You know, uh, entrepreneurs who were earlier in another firm, maybe as co-founders, but then they move on to do their own thing. So I think you just have to uh, try to be with people now. Obviously, everybody can't be in that. So then they may have to find you know virtual groups right. uh, who, who provide that. And, and that's very important. Nandan, is the answer to India's economic challenges, employment challenges, entrepreneurship? Oh, absolutely. I think I think job creation will be done by entrepreneurs. Uh, and obviously, you have very large companies which will hire thousands of people, and that that will continue. But if you want widespread jobs, you need you know maybe a million entrepreneurs, each of whom creates multiple jobs. So I think entrepreneurship is the key to job creation. And then you talked about talent density. Let's marry it to your idea of uh, how entrepreneurship is important. Which sectors, which regions, which areas of India have a thin talent density as far as entrepreneurs are concerned and require urgent attention? Today, the talent density is emerging in many cities. Clearly, we have Bangalore, Chennai, Hyderabad, Pune, that's yes. one. Then we have a huge talent density in the national capital region, right. that's Delhi, Narda, Gurgaon. And I think uh, 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 more will emerge. I think one of the good things about what happened post the pandemic is that the talent density is getting dispersed. For example, at Infosys now, we have many more uh, centers in smaller towns, Wysak, Wysak right. Hubli, uh, like that. So I think as more and more cities uh, disperse, especially for remote work and so on, it's becoming easier. Uh, I think we will have talent dispersal everywhere. So if there are 15 Mumbai's, Mumbai will have lesser pressure and 15 other cities will have the opportunities available for everybody. To totally. I, th I think actually India is lucky because it has thousands of small towns. It's, it's like, uh, you know, we have st small towns all over the place. Right. And each of them becomes a magnet for talent and then creates entrepreneurship and creates value, then the whole thing gets widely dispersed. So will that be like a, a general specialization where each city will have a lot of industries or will that be will it be very specialized stuff that, you know how uh, Denver is known for, you know, automotive yeah. engineering and LA is known for the film industry. Yeah. Are we going to go there as a well, country? Well, I think so because, you know, people attract people of similar interests. Right. Uh, and uh, it, it could be anything. It could be... Uh, you know, EV manufacturing, which right. is a new activity coming up and a city may have a lot of EV manufacturing or right. it could be education like we have in Kota and so on. So each, each city will sort of develop its own niche. I am a young guy and I have immediate needs to meet, which is 
I want to buy that car, I want to uh, provide for my family, I want to plan for my child. But I'm a patriotic Indian as well and I want to do work for impact and unfortunately most of the times I've realized the twins don't meet. How do you approach that? Because you, you've seen both the journeys. Uh, I mean, some people choose to join public service right after they graduate, they appear for a UPSC right. exam and all that. Uh, but in my case, I think I did have a full career in the private sector. I was at Infosys for close to uh, 30 years. Yeah, but you uh, built Bangalore, no, but, for example. Yeah, so that time, you know, I always had this feeling that, you know, whatever you're doing, you have to do things beyond yourself or your company. So I did the BATF uh, 20, 25 years back. But I think the important thing is uh, my big jump or big was joining the government hmm. in 2009 to build a, uh, the Aadhaar platform. Right. right. No, that was actually not a difficult decision for me because at that time as I already had a successful private sector career, I was financially okay. So I could take that leap and take the plunge. I mean, the worst thing that would happen is I would fail, that's all. Right. So if you're prepared for that, then you can take it. It's sometimes uh, you have to earn the right to do the things that you truly want to do by doing the things that society wants you to do to absolutely, first absolutely. get there. That's right? a great way of putting it. So I think, uh, I mean, my first public engagement mm. was uh, uh, only 99, 2000, which was, uh, you know, when I was, just, I was 45 already. So, right. so I think you can, it's not that you have to jump into doing some public work, impactful work at, at 30. You can build build a company or do whatever you want, uh, work with, and then over time you 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 know you get more more uh, strength to take on other things. And then how do you define your family? Is it your immediate relatives, the city that you've seen grow up around you and contributed in building, uh, the country that you're a part of and you've done a variety of things for? Everybody defines pa their own patriotism in different ways. How sure. do you define yours? Well, I think all of the above. I mean, obviously, mm. we ha we have a good family and, you know, uh, we all meet very often. We are all scattered all over the world. So we try to meet at least once or twice a year. Right. And, you know, we all get along well. So there's that part. Then there's my college family, all my friends from IIT. We're having a get-together in Bangalore wow. in February. Then, of course, my professional family, I mean, I think the people I've worked with at Infosys, the whole startup family. So there are many, right. many families. And I think having these multiple connections is very important because once you're part of multiple families, then, you know, each, each gives you a different insight or each gives you a different viewpoint. And therefore, you become much more, much better at putting together different things. Okay, uh, let's talk about uh, patriotism for the country specifically and I'm coming at it from the point of view of the national level impact things that you have, uh, you know, executed over the last couple of decades. Is there a love for the country that's necessary to be able to execute these things of this scale? Yeah, well, yeah, sure, absolutely. I, th I think the thing is what drives me is when I can see something and know it can be much better. Hmm. You know, that that sort of gives me the impetus to fix it. Right. So, you know, I think even in my book, I wrote a book called Imagining yes. India in 2008. I talked about why a digital ID is something we need. And uh, then thanks to that, and there was a government project to give an ID, not a digital ID, just an ID, right. unique ID. I got an offer to join the government, which I took. And then, you know, I think I'm the only person who got a job because I wrote something in a book. So, <laughs> so then, my job was to implement that idea, right? Right. And I could visualize, you know, what what is what it could mean if everybody has a digital ID, online authentication. You could go anywhere, you know, open a bank account. So we had some vague vision of that. So I think when you can see something and then say, oh, this this is the way it can be, but all it requires is effort to get there. Then you get motivated to do the effort. So that was when I did the right. Aadhaar project. Similarly. As an advisor to NPCI, we, yeah. you know, we, we said, why, why can't we have a simpler payment system, real time, anywhere, anyone, any bank account, any mobile phone, and that's what led to the UPI design, right. which became another success, and and the many others. So I think all this comes from the sense, this could be better, hmm. and then some tech can actually solve this thing, and tech at population scale can impact the life of a billion people. Right. So that's what then you get the jatka to do it. Do you also get the jatka from the idea that 
many generations will remember that this there was this guy who built this for the first time for the country does that give well, you a kick I'm, i'm not really doing it as a legacy thing hmm. Hmm. Uh, i think it comes from a desire to keep adding value hmm. perpetually add value which is maybe not the right thing to i don't know so i just feel that as long as i can do it i should and because i over the years i've accumulated the knowledge or the knowledge uh, network networks skills. to get things done yeah. i shouldn't waste it i should i should put it to good good use as an individual doesn't it lead to anxiety so no. every time you see a problem like okay this also i i can fix but it means there is a journey i have to go through yeah. again no no i'm very choosy about hmm. that i can't fix everything of course uh, yeah. but i i have actually a way of looking at it hmm. you know i want high impact but i want high impact with low resistance right For, if we do a 2 by 2 low impact high impact low 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 Resistance. friction high friction right high friction high impact is very difficult it how the time you are dealing with some opposition but if you look at the quadrant which is high impact low friction you know that's the best place to be because it has a impact but there's not enough opposition to it right to come in the way can you give me some examples that you may have considered which you then classified as high impact high friction things and hence you said okay that's not something i no, want no i realized that when i did uh, bangalore's uh, the batf hmm. because physical infrastructure in the city there a lot of interest right you know so you want to get a road done or you know it's, it's very very you know it's pretty complicated right and right. you know there is real estate interest this interest land this that so i did that for 5 years and i learned that this is not my game and then i realized that interestingly in india unlike in the west digital infrastructure is greenfield there's right. no there's no legacy right right and also we are always leapfrogging yeah. the technology so when you're so leapfrogging on technology yeah. uh, actually there's no 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 resistance no right? precedence no resistance yeah, nobody comes no existing way. frameworks ah, chalo, you yes. can do it and right. so I, so I, then i decided about 2000 eight or nine that i'll focus on digital infrastructure that's when i then the, i did all this stuff so i focus on things which has a maybe may take four five years to bake and to crystallize but once it happens then suddenly it has a lot of impact if india becomes a superpower how would it be different from all the global powers that have come up till now well i think india is a, a benign country it has no imperial ambitions so i think it will be a, a good powerful country in the world a one that uh brings about uh, more friendship among nations tries to play a positive role uh in the future of the world because the world is you know has lot of uh, challenges so i see I, that's where i see it and to the question is that i think india is very well placed hmm. young population demographic dividend uh i think uh, huge services industry we are providing services to the world uh very good digital infrastructure and now physical infrastructure is improving very quickly as you can see with the rapid development of so many roads airports and so on right uh, and then because of the fact that uh, countries want to diversify their manufacturing uh, more and more manufacturing is coming to india that's the that's the big one right like manufacturing yeah, that, coming to india yeah, is that's very huge. significant i mean i mean you know one of the things i did last year was i want to really see what is happening on this so i went to visit some of the electronics uh, factories hmm. amazing they are very very state of the art very sophisticated you know so i i think I, many of them hire only women so it's quite mm. interesting how mm. they evolve so i think when i look at all this uh, i think uh, india is in a very good uh, place and so i think yeah if we can pull it off it also means you know improvement of uh, incomes for a billion people better quality there are right. challenges of climate and all there are issues to deal with but what am it it's a great place to be let's talk about technology how does a common indian change his attitude or his perspective towards technology from being a challenger or a replacer to an enabler well i personally find that indians are very good at accepting adapting to technology you know when we started the ada project uh, all my urban friends said why do you need this mere paas driver's license hai mere paas passport hai what they don't realize is that only 50 million people have a passport right or you know at that, that time maybe 20 million people pay taxes maybe 100 million people have a driver's license 
But when you realize that a billion people, many of them don't have ID, they're leaving the village and coming to the city, they're looking for jobs, uh, nobody's giving them a job because they don't have ID. For them, an ID is an impediment. So when we started the Aadhaar enrollment, we found we didn't have to evangelize the idea at all. People came in droves. They were already yeah, solved. Yeah, I mean, wow. Long queues in some village in Jharkhand and all that. So then you realize that actually, if, if you can give people, they didn't know what it would do. Obviously, they didn't understand online right. authentication and all that. But they said, here is an economic asset that the state is giving everybody. This will be useful for me. I don't know how. But they went for it in droves. Or if you look at UPI, I mean, UPI today has 350 million users. Yeah, I think we do more transactions in a month compared to what US does in like a year yeah, or something. So 350 million users, yeah. 11 billion transactions a month, 50 million merchants take UPI payments. Right. So that vegetable vendor on the street with a cart is taking UPI. Now, why is she doing it? One, it's improving her productivity. You can get the money quickly. Second, it's improving her safety because she has no cash. Right. Nobody can steal it from her. So they have taken to it. Nobody has sold them the idea. But as soon as they see a technology, uh, phones, I mean phones, both earlier with um, you know, the smart, uh, feature phones and now with smartphones, they've just taken it to it. Right. So you know, I think Indians particularly have a good relationship with the technology. What is the one trait that I need to work on to be selected to work in Nandan Nilekani's impact teams? It could be in any of his projects. I think I would look first of all for motivation, you know, what is, what is the motivation and if people have genuine motivation to bring about transformation, to bring about change, that's what I would, I would look for because I, motivation is, is very important. Obviously skill and talent is important, <clears throat> but motivation is, is very important. You would hire for motivation only? Oh yeah, no, motiv because motivation takes care of a lot of other things. Hmm. If somebody is highly motivated, they'll get their skills. They learn how to work with others. Right. So motivation is, is a huge passion. Motivation is, 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 is a huge thing. And the good thing is that uh, what happens now is that there's some kind of self-selection. Hmm. That the person who walks in to see me will only come because he thinks that he has a chance to be part of a high impact team. So that way it, it sort of right. solves itself. Right. Uh, among the people that you've worked with over the years, and I know you speak a lot about Mr. Murthy, what are some of the people who've had the deepest impact in you as a professional? Te no, tell obviously, us about. Mr. Murthy and then my other co-founders at Infosys are also there. Uh, someone like Bill Gates, right. whom I meet uh, quite often. And what I like about him is that he still is obviously one of the richest men in the world, but he still works very hard. And still, he's also you know, looking at impact and so on. Uh, Dr. Vijay Kelkar, who was the cha uh, chairman of the Finance Commission and former right. Finance Secretary, he's 80 years old but always forward-looking and positive. These are some of the people that I, I admire and have, I've learned from. I mean, there are many others, so not mentioning them doesn't mean that they're not there. No, no, got it. Uh, do you have any biases in working with old people or young people? No, I treat everybody the same. Hmm. That's actually one of the reasons I think I, I'm, I'm quote-unquote successful, which hmm. is, I have no bias against anyone. I will take them on merit, and I will treat a 25-year-old with the same respect I'll treat uh, someone my age. Okay, so you wouldn't value someone who is, uh, uh, where it is assumed that he will be more with it, with the trends, versus someone who has a lot of experience in doing a bunch of things. You don't yeah. value, value no, one or the other. it's not just that. I, you know, I find that uh, the younger person is more open, uh, does not know what can go wrong, which is a good thing sometimes. Mm. Because sometimes if your head is full of what can go wrong, then you don't know anything. Whereas a young person can sort of break the envelope, break the whole thing there. Uh, but I think also ideas, life, you know, and you know, I, I learn a lot. So because I treat everyone with the same respect, that's actually a good thing. It uh, enables me to have a team which is very uh, different, but all working together. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Nandan, Thank for giving you. us the time and your consideration. Sure, sure. Uh, we are very proud uh, of what you are doing for our country and for the society in general. Uh, I speak for everyone and myself. That is a career highlight to be able to sit across the table and talk to you and about a variety of things that you've done. 
uh, wish we wish you all the best just as a young person who's just starting his career we feel like you've only just started and we are expecting lots of amazing things from you and we we'll look forward to seeing you do amazing things thank you so much thank I'm you so much for your support. thank I you appreciate it